Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Hi friends. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Special Education Advocacy Podcast with Ashley Barlow. I'm Ashley Barlow and I'm so happy you're here. Today we talk with my friend Deanna Abril, who is an attorney in Florida and also the mom to an adorable little guy, Lucas, who has autism. Deanna is kind of new in her parent advocacy journey, and I thought her story would be helpful to share with you, particularly if you are embarking on this special education advocacy journey as a parent or as somebody that is new to advocacy altogether. Because what we talk about in today's episode is really kind of three main topics. We talk about the importance of parent advocacy altogether. And that's actually a topic that Deanna is going to be talking about at my special education and advocacy conference. That conference is taking place on January 23rd, 2020. It's entirely free, entirely virtual. And if you haven't already registered, I encourage you to check out the website, which is ashleybarlowco.com backslash conference. All of the details are there. So Deanna and I talk about the importance of parent advocacy and why it is so, so important for parents to get involved. But even if you've assumed that fact, it's still intimidating. And so what I really dug into with Deanna is how to get started in that advocacy journey, what skills an advocate needs, and then tackling the mom guilt. How do I cope with the fact that I don't have all the answers and sometimes I don't even know where to find the answers. And so this podcast will help you probably no matter where you are in your advocacy journey, but particularly if you are at the beginning of the journey. Deanna is one of our speakers at the conference, which is on January 23rd. She's a wonderful friend. She's an incredible advocate. She's a special education attorney that's new to the field. I think you're going to like today's episode. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining me for the Special Education Advocacy with Ashley Barlow podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, and I'm your host. Today, I'm also your guest. That's right, today's kind of an all about me. See, I had a friend who is an advocacy rock star reach out to me a couple of weeks ago and she said, you know, I referred somebody to your website because they are an attorney and they want to do more special education work and I told her that I would be um, certain that you would connect with her, but she went to your website and it doesn't have a whole lot about you. And I went over because I thought, well, surely it does. And actually it doesn't. (laughs) And so I thought, here I am. I'm asking you to tell me all about yourselves and I'm connecting with you and I'm giving you all this information. And you're probably like, who is that girl? What are we talking about? What's her experience? And so I'm sitting here in a comfy chair in my office. If you're watching on YouTube, um, you can see my comfy armchair. I've got a cup of hot tea, cinnamon tea that I love. And I thought I would just tell you a little bit of my story. Now, I don't have a whole lot of notes for this podcast. It is literally on this small little post-it note what I plan to talk about. And so this might be a little raw. It might be a little rambling. I don't know how it's going to go. But I just thought, you know, that it was time for me to tell you a little bit about my story. So the first thing that you need to know is that when I was a little girl, my favorite t-shirt said girls can do anything. And I really took it to heart. I have a grit and a determination that I don't know that anybody else has. If I wanna do something, I am going to do it. 
I always say to an attorney, the word no doesn't really mean no. But to me, even when I was a teacher, even when I was a kid, the word no has really never meant no. Now I'm super respectful and I am super duper um, keen to manners and to kind of a, a Southern style. But when I hear no, I really think, oh, well, I mean, how else could we do it in order to get that to be a yes? So girls can do anything is kind of the motto I've lived my life by. I wake up almost every morning and say girls can do anything. And I do that for a variety of reasons. And I'm going to talk to you about those reasons. So I grew up here in Kentucky where my office is, where my house is. Actually, so um, from the house where I currently live with my husband and my two boys to my office is a 1.2 mile commute. And in that 1.2 miles, we pass the elementary school where Jack goes to school, the middle school where our, where our older son Griffin goes to school, the high school where he will go to school, which is also the high school where my husband and I went to school. You would pass my childhood home, the office where my dad worked, the school where my mom worked as a teacher, our pool, and you, if you just backtracked about a half a mile, you would also pass the church that I grew up in. So that is how small and close knit our little community is. Um, and that's where I grew up. So when I was 15 years old, I was in a gasoline explosion. My, my family had a wave runner. We have a, um, a little lake house, we call it our summer cottage, um, that's about 45 minutes away from our home. And when I was a little girl, we went there every weekend. Um, my dad is an attorney and um, you know I was born in 1978, so I'm a child of the 80s. And um, cell phones were kind of new. My dad had one of the first cell phones of anybody that I know, but um, for the majority of my childhood, our home phone rang off the hook. Clients would call from jail, they'd call with problems in their divorces, they would call with a small business that was blowing up, a financial thing that was happening. The phone rang and rang and rang. And so when I was in kindergarten, my parents said, you know, we need a place to go away for the weekend um, and we don't want a phone. And so they bought this little summer cottage. Um, at first, we just each had a bedroom. They've now added on um, and it's gotten a little bit bigger. But what we would do is we would go down with families every single weekend. So Saturday, a family would come down. Sunday, a family would come down and we'd play volleyball and horseshoes and um, you know all kinds of stuff in the lawn. And then we'd play in the water and we'd ski and, and whatnot. So my brother and I are six years apart. And when my brother went to college, my parents got me a wave runner, which is like a jet ski, um, probably to entertain me, you know, to make it a little bit more um, appealing to leave the pool and my friends on the weekend. And so I was 15 years old and the wave runner had not been starting. And so my dad added a choke to it, which is, um, I'm not very mechanical, but it's like a thing that takes the gas straight from the gas tank tank part of the wave runner into um, like the starter, so to speak. And it turns out that that choke line had a crimp in it. Um, somehow it was bent or something. And um, so gas fumes were building up, but the um, gas was not getting to the starter. So my dad and I went down and very strangely, we did not have a um, another family at the cottage this particular day. And so we went down on the dock and we washed it and we washed the wave runner and um, I complained for years after this that he made me wash and wax the wave runner and then the darn thing blew up and I was like, I had to do a chore and it, and it still didn't serve me any good. Um, but we got it all washed up and my dad pumped it a couple of times and I, he said, hey, hop on it and see if it'll start. And I hopped on. Um, we don't know what sparked it, but it exploded. It blew me higher than our boathouse, which um, at that time stood about 20 feet in the air. So um, we think I probably went about 22 feet in the air, a couple feet forward, landed in the water, um, and I ended up with four compression fractures. So compression fractures happen from inertia. So my body um, wanted to stay down because of gravity and the explosion shot me up, which just compressed my vertebrae. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, you've got the 
advantage of seeing me, I always um, kind of hold up my index finger and my thumb and say, so your, your vertebrae are supposed to be um, squares or rectangles and mine are kind of like crunched on either side. So they look more like trapezoids and then they have cracks that go through them. And now that I'm in my forties, they have um, all kinds of like delicious soft tissue stuff and bursitis and arthritis and <laughs> bone spurs and all kinds of things like that. So my injury and the reason why I just spent a second talking about my injury um, really helped to shape my adult life because I really um, learned a lot in the experience of getting hurt and uh, my community's reaction. So I had that girls can do anything spirit. I've got the grit, I've got the determination. Um, and then I quickly learned that I had this amazing team behind me also. Um, I, again, in this small community, I had babysat for the hospital administrator. He now actually lives across the street from me. My orthopedic surgeon, um, his daughter was my brother's best friend. She was a groomsman, um, so to speak, in my brother's wedding. And I had babysat for the um, surgeon's son as well, and our parents are friends. Um, and so I showed up at the hospital. Our surgeon, who was not on call or not even on duty, met me at the hospital. Um, immediately transferred me to the hospital that was closer to our home. And um, then by the very next morning, I had flowers by like eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and our, the hospital administrator said to my mom, you know, if there's anything that I know about Ashley, it's that she needs people. And so I am going to remove any visiting hours from her chart and I'm going to allow people to come visit any time. And so my friends, I was a swimmer, and my friends would come every single morning before practice, which sometimes was like six o'clock in the morning, and then every single afternoon in between their practices in order to hang out, to play cards, to watch movies, to chat, to just sit there while I slept. Um, and I really started to know the amount of love that existed in the world. Love to me, but I knew that that love wasn't unique to me. It was just true love and support. Now, my can-do attitude helped me um, significantly in my recovery. The orthopedic surgeon who knew me so well said, as soon as everything starts working again in your body, I'm gonna get you home. Um, I would put you in a body cast, but I know you well enough to know that you're responsible, and if I say don't move, you're not gonna move. And so um, he sent me home on day seven. I would have otherwise been in the hospital over a month and I got to recover at home, which was quite a blessing. And you know, those friends kept coming by and people kept cooking only it wasn't hospital food, it was much better food. Um, and so I had a, a very um, easy, um, quick recovery considering the circumstances. I can't say it was easy altogether, but considering the circumstances, it was great. But something else happened as a result of my injury. I woke up the next morning in the hospital and I had had obviously a rough night, extremely, extremely painful. Once the shock wears off, the pain really starts to hit. And we had a hard time managing my pain. And I, I was starting to have an emotional um, understanding of what was happening. I remember the doctor telling me I couldn't go to swim team practice the next day. And I was like, that was the first time I cried um, because he said, no, you can't, you aren't gonna go to practice for a while. And I just burst into tears like, oh, well then this must be fairly significant. So I woke up the next morning and my mom said to me, okay, here's the deal. This is serious. This is a big deal. And you can be a victim or you can be a survivor. And if you're a victim, you're gonna walk around, you're, something's gonna hurt probably every day of the rest of your life. And you're gonna walk around and you're gonna tell everybody about it and people are gonna get tired of hearing about it and people are gonna get tired of sitting with you and that kind of stuff. Or you can be a, a survivor and you can make the most of this and you can maybe even learn something from it. And I was like, well, I'm gonna be a survivor. I'm gonna have a positive attitude and I'm gonna get my way through this. 
And so every day I wake up and I have pain. I, you know, scale of one to 10, I don't know. Like some days I have a really high tolerance for pain. So to me, it's maybe like a two. I don't know what it would be for other people, but um, I have a really high pain tolerance. But every single day I wake up and something hurts, something doesn't feel right, something whatever. And I actually am grateful for it because what I say is, this is like my secret. It's like my superpower. Only I know how tough I am. Only I know how much I go through just to get out of bed, just to stand to make the cookies for the class before Valentine's Day, just to sit at the table and wrap the presents for the extra hour in order to get it done. Only I know how much that hurts and how much I sacrifice in order to maintain a positive disposition. And it makes me even more proud of myself and it makes me understand myself all the much more. And so I really have kind of carried that mentality with me as well. This, I am a survivor, I am a positive person, I've got the grit and the determination to get through anything, and truly positivity and optimism, collaboration, all of those things are a choice. And it's a choice that I would make time and time and time again. Because see, when you get hurt when you're 15 years old, what you really start to understand is people. I really started to understand how empathetic certain people were. I started to understand that I actually don't like sympathy. I started to understand the way people tick and what people like to be around and how people interact with one another. Because for me, it was so, so basic. I started to see the good in people and I wanted more of that. And I figured out that if you are positive, if you approach things with a positive outlook and optimism, you're gonna get a lot further in life. And what that did was that totally shaped my experience as the parent of a child with a disability. So I had Griffin um, and he was about, I don't know, two and a half when I got pregnant. He was, I guess, three when I delivered Jack. And so I was, um, so I, I got pregnant with Griffin, it, or with Jack, pardon me. It did take me, I don't know, it took us a little bit longer to get pregnant with Jack, but not a terrible amount of time. And I had just told my family that I was pregnant. In fact, we had a party, my cousin was in town for Thanksgiving. And so we had a party, we live in Kentucky, so everybody watches Kentucky basketball games. And we had my whole family over the Wednesday before Thanksgiving in order to celebrate my cousin being in town and to watch the Kentucky game. And I had told everybody I was pregnant as they were coming in and you know, everybody was excited and whatnot. And I went upstairs because that's what you do at a party when you have to go to the bathroom. I went upstairs and I had a little bit of a pregnancy scare. And I thought, oh my gosh, here I am. I've just told people, literally some people like 20 minutes ago, and now I might not be pregnant. And of course it was a holiday weekend, so I had to wait all weekend long. And of course, you know that Jack is here. And so the pregnancy carried on and everything was just fine. It actually happened any time that I um, exerted myself whatsoever during my pregnancy and also on every single three-day weekend. I would have a little bit of a scare that would require an ultrasound, which was just plain inconvenient. You know, you can be optimistic, but that was inconvenient. But I remember that day before Thanksgiving when I was pregnant with Jack, I remember talking to God and, and literally having a conversation, not so much of a prayer, but a conversation. I remember saying, okay, so if this is a question about whether or not I want this baby, because it did take me a second to get pregnant. And if this is a question of this baby might be a little bit different, but do you, is this the baby for you? I want this baby. And I, and I want every single part of this baby. I know this is the baby for me and I want this baby. And I didn't really realize it in that moment. I didn't realize what was happening, but you know, a lot of people, um, when they tell their birth stories, particularly people in communities where they get diagnoses of, of developmental disabilities pretty early on or close to their delivery, like, um, a lot of people or most people in the Down syndrome community do, um, they say, did you know? Well, no, I didn't know. We didn't have a prenatal diagnosis. But as I look back, I never thought about it 
after that. But as I look back, I think I did know. I think I knew in that moment upstairs at my house with a big loud party going on that something special was about to happen. And I think I committed myself right then that I was just going to do the next thing. And I was going to maintain that optimism and that grit and that determination that I had um, as I parented this baby that I hadn't even met. So Jack was born on the 4th of July. Now I have this big, bold personality and my delivery with Griffin, my older son was horrendous. And I mean horrendous, every part of horrendous. I can be a very strong advocate um, and my smile can leave my face. And believe you me, my smile left my face when I was um, laboring with Griffin. Both of my parents advocated for me and I just had a terrible delivery story. Plain and simple, I had a terrible delivery story. So when I um, knew that I wanted to have another baby, I, I tease and say I doctor shopped, which is something that people do when they're going to look for medication. <laughs> I didn't doctor shop looking for narcotics. I doctor shopped literally interviewing doctors because I wanted um, to find not only a doctor that I liked, but a hospital where I would have a better delivery experience. And so I went and I found this doctor and I adored him. He had been recommended by a couple of friends and I absolutely adored him. And I probably had, I don't know, one or two visits before I got pregnant. And so, you know, I had talked to him and, and he knew that I had, that we had friends in common and um, that sort of thing. And so I had developed a bit of a relationship with this doctor. And then certainly as I was pregnant and I had all of these holiday weekend things going on and a couple of other things, and certainly with my back, um, I wasn't considered high risk, but I was um, getting a little bit more care than I had during my first pregnancy. And so, I don't know, probably two or three months in, he said, well, we've got our call scheduled, and so if you want to go ahead and schedule a repeat C-section, we could do that. And I was really shocked because when I delivered Griffin, um, they wouldn't schedule an induction until I was like 38 weeks or something. And so I was like, wow, really? We can schedule already? And he said, yeah. And I was due on July 14th, but I was early with Griffin. And so he said, um, well, I'm working 4th of July weekend, um, but I think that's a little bit too early. So then we did it like the week after that. And I said, well, I was early with Griffin. So I think I'm going to have him on the 4th of July. And that's my favorite holiday. So that's perfect. And he, you know, just kind of laughed and whatever. I mean, I'm kind of silly most of the time. And so, you know, every time they took my, they, they would put the ultrasound thing on the heart rate, I would say, does it sound like a girl? Cause I, um, I have three nephews on one side and then Griffin. And so Jack would have been and is the fifth boy on that side of my family. I do, I have a niece on my husband's side, but um, I really, 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 I always tell Jack, he's everything I ordered from God, except he's not twin girls. <laughs> because I wanted, um, I really, really, really wanted twin girls my whole life. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, so the doctor kind of knew that I was silly and I think he said, okay, yeah, 4th of July. But the closer and closer it got, the more it looked like I was going to deliver early. And so I kept saying, what about 4th of July? Could we do it on the 4th of July? Well, a week before the 4th of July, I felt like garbage and I didn't, well, I didn't really, my labor with Griffin was so weird that I didn't really know what labor was going to feel like. Um, and so I said to my husband, I think we need to go to the hospital. I don't know if this is labor, but whatever. So a week before I delivered Jack, I went and it turns out it was heat exhaustion, which I do <laughs> get fairly often. In my defense, it felt different when I was pregnant. So I was just dehydrated and nauseous and whatnot, and they sent me home. So when I called the doctor on the 4th of July, he kind of teased me and he said, I don't believe you. Um, call me back when your contractions are however far apart. So I actually started writing it down then. And I called him and I was like, I'm so sorry, but they are this close together um, and I think I should come into the hospital. He said, well, I still don't believe you. I'm going to go to church. It was a Sunday. I'm going to go to church um, and you call me when... Um, you are, and, and I'll have them call me if you're as far along as, as what you suspect. 
So I get to the hospital um, and they do all the checks and whatnot and they say, okay, well, this is when we're gonna call the doctor and I'm gonna come back in an hour. Well, after half an hour, the nurse was like, I think we might need to um, you know, check you again even early. So get checked, everything's fine. 40 minutes, she's like, we gotta check you in. And she's like, we gotta call the doctor, <laughs> this is serious. So whereas he thought it was gonna be kind of an all day thing, or maybe I wasn't even in labor, in 40 minutes, I was ready to deliver. And don't forget, it's 4th of July. So I couldn't get any, they couldn't get my labs um, to be read. They took the labs, that was no problem, but they could not get them read. And I was scheduled for, I was gonna have a C-section and so they can't do the epidural and all the other stuff until they know maybe your platelet count, I think, so you don't bleed out or something. I don't really remember, but literally I was hugging the pillow. If you've had a baby and you've had an epidural, you know you kind of like hug this pillow and make your spine into like a C shape with a nurse behind me with this ginormous epidural needle. And um, if you're watching on YouTube um, in this small community, I um, just saw my neighbor walk by. So I gave a wave to my neighbor. So I'm hugging the pillow and I have um, the epidural needle like kind of poised at my back and I am praying the Hail Mary a thousand times over and over and over again because that's what I was doing for the pain. Um, and they were hitting refresh on the computer waiting for my labs to load. And that is literally, at one point I said, are you like hitting refresh? And they said, that's literally what we do. We sit here and we hit refresh. Um, and so I had this like astronomically crazy delivery again, all beyond the control of my amazing doctor, but it still again was just crazy. And so we, they, they, he asked us what music we wanted to play. Jack was born to Jimmy Buffett, son of a sailor. We, my husband and I are huge parrot heads. Um, and so he says, the baby's here. I forgot to tell you, um, I don't know, maybe like April. He was born in July, probably around April. Um, it, I think it actually was Easter, the Easter holiday. Of course, I had trouble because it was a holiday weekend. Um, they started doing biophysical exams. And really they started doing it because Jack's um, arms and legs were not proportionate to the size of his body. I had also had a level two ultrasound to check to see if he had Down syndrome or dwarfism. And the result of that was no, unequivocally no. So when Jack was born, they said 10 fingers, 10 toes, I heard him cry and I said, see, he is absolutely fine. All of that trouble that you put me through, all of those extra appointments, and I'm like teasing the doctor. And he said to the um, resident or fellow or whoever was assisting him, he said, I'm gonna have um, you go ahead and close and I'm gonna go take a closer look at the baby. So he walks around my feet and he goes over to um, Jack and they had just given Jack to my husband. And the doctor looked at him and he said, Ashley, I think he has the facial characteristics of a child with Down syndrome. We're gonna send him to the special care nursery, but he looks perfectly healthy and beautiful to me. And I said, get him out of my husband's arms, Brandon's gonna faint. <laughs> And so I was like, somebody help my husband. That is not the news you want to get when you're holding a precious baby. He's going to pass out. So they take care of, of Brandon. They get him a chair. They Somebody gets Jack. I take a look at him and I like kind of nodded my head and I said, well, what do we do next? Now, a lot of people that get diagnoses, particularly right at birth, are devastated and have a significant emotional reaction. I've had that. My husband has had that. In the operating room, in that moment, I think I had had the experience of the victim and survivor um, discussion. And I said, all right, well, this is Jack. Look at how awesome he is. What are we going to do next? What's the next step to awesome? What's the next step to Survivor? I'm gonna knock this baby out of the ballpark. He's mine, he's gorgeous, where do we go next? 
Of course, we have grieved the baby that we thought we had. We have grieved the experiences that we thought we would experience. We grieve the stress and the um, the added um, responsibilities and the worries. We grieve those when they come. But in that particular moment, I know this is super um, a atypical, and it is probably, if you have had an experience like it, it is probably not like what you had, and I absolutely honor your experience as well. But I said, all right, what do we do next? And they were like, well, calm down, hold, hold your horses, whatever. So they didn't send them straight to the special care nursery either, because I was like, well, I like to nurse my babies as soon as they are born, and so I want to get to recovery so I can nurse. And boy, was that ever funny because the nurses were like, well, you know, some babies with Down syndrome, they might, he might like turn blue and he might not um, be able to, um, what do they call that? Latch on and he might not, and they like, we're all in a tizzy. Let us go get a, a um, pump and, and then you can get started and then you can feed him. And I was like, okay. So they go to get all the pump and everything. And I say to Brandon, give me the baby. And my husband is a rules follower. So he's like, I'm not giving you the baby. They said they want you to pump first. And I was like, give me the baby. <laughs> he said, I want for you to pump first, the nurses. And I was like, yes, I am his mother. And look at him. He looks hungry. I want to feed him. <laughs> Excuse me. I did not know that I would like nursing as much as I did until I had Griffin. And so I, I start to feed Jack and the nurses um, come in and they're like, oh my goodness, is he okay? Is he? And of course I'm grateful that they were conscious of his health, um, but they just couldn't believe it. And then I was like, oh, but yeah, go ahead and give me that pump because I'm probably gonna need it um, because he's probably not gonna empty me. And they just thought that was like total overachieving and they couldn't believe it. And I'm like, well, that's who I am. <laughs> like, I, I want to go the extra mile and everything. Any job worth doing is worth doing well. And so that is Jack's birth story. That is how the firecracker Yankee Doodle Dandy Jack Barlow entered the world. I said, what do I do next? And I have continued to just do the next thing. Now, there was a time period um, early on in Jack's life when I started to get worried because I felt very overwhelmed by all of the decisions, all of the doctor's appointments, all of the responsibilities, the paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. And my dad said to me, listen, look at that baby. He is awesome. I'm sure he was asleep because he slept like every single minute of his life until he was about six <laughs> weeks old. And so my dad said, look at that baby. Look at how awesome he is. Look at his beautiful cheeks and all 10 toes and look at how great he is. And yeah, he's probably going to have like a 10% factor. He's probably going to be 10% more work than Griffin ever was. But today he's great. So let's take it day by day, minute by minute. And that's what we've done. In fact, I think I said this on Kara Riska's podcast when I was on it a couple of months ago, but there's an author called Glennon Doyle, and Glennon wrote, I think it's just in a, um, a blog of hers, but it might actually be in her first book, Carry On Warrior. She said that um, the idea of carpe diem was stressful to her, like seizing an entire day. Who can seize an entire day? And so rather, she likes the phrase carpe kairos, which is seize the moment. And that's truly what we um, adopted as kind of a mentality when Jack was a baby. We thought, okay, well, we're just gonna go minute by minute, hour by hour, appointment by appointment, everything's good today, we don't have to worry about tomorrow. And that was really good advice. And it was really, really helpful for me to hear in that um, first, I don't know, month of his life or whenever it was, it could have been the first day of his life, it all kind of runs together. So Jack entered the world and we immediately got a community. We immediately got those early intervention therapists who become like family. You know, you first say, I don't want people in my house. And then within two or three weeks, they've taken your couch cushions off of your couch and they've seen all the goldfish and the coins and the Nerf bullets and all of the schmutz that's inside of your couch. And you're like, well, I guess you're family now. And then when your child turns three, you mourn their loss <laughs> because you're used to seeing them at least once a week probably. And you're used to them helping you to raise your child, literally helping 
you to raise your child. And you realize that you need that community. You need the therapists and the doctors and the friends and the grandparents and the teachers. You need all of those people. They're all part of your community and they all become so, so valuable. And really having Jack kind of taught me a lesson and that is super simple. The people that are good to Jack, the people that really see Jack, the people that are understanding that will go a little bit slower, that will talk about something that isn't super interesting to them. Those people are just plain good people. And they're my kind of people as a result of that. And so Jack taught me kind of this important lesson that he is the barometer. If somebody's good to Jack, they're okay in my book. Now, the opposite of that is not true. And sometimes we get stuck thinking, oh, that person is just like super intolerant of Jack. And you can't then necessarily say, well, that person's not for me. Because, you know, we all have different tolerances and we all have different souls. And so we have to look a little bit deeper into appreciating some people. But we can't say, well, not good to Jack, not a good person, because that isn't necessarily true. So in this story, I wanna tell you a little bit about some of the things that Jack's life and Jack's impact um, on our world has had. So one of them is that as a result of having Jack, I got a place to channel my advocacy. So I've always known that I care. In fact, you could even argue that I care too much. Um, I was a very, very principled teenager. Um, my parents came on a trip abroad that I had. I was a German education major and I was spending a summer semester in Germany and um, the professors that were in charge of it, um, one of them was, in my opinion, like not super caring. Um, I showed up late to the to the thing because we to the entire summer because we had flight troubles and they didn't even meet us at the train station and I think I kind of held a grudge because I was like oh my gosh I'm arriving in a foreign country I've led these other people through this because I was the only one of us that spoke German very well and we've been traveling for 28 hours and you can't even meet us at the train station and I think I kind of held this grudge. And so my parents have now joined us and we're six weeks into the summer um, and we get back on the bus after a tour or something. And I started counting to make sure that everybody was there. And my mom was like, whoa, you're not the teacher, calm down, like take off your bossy pants for a second. And I was like, what mom? I mean, we could have lost somebody, you know? And she's like, calm down. And that's kind of the way that I behaved always. Just this real like passion and involvement and maybe um, bossiness that I had. And so I remember um, I had Griffin, but I didn't have Jack yet. One Thanksgiving in those, I guess, three years, um, we were kind of talking about what are you grateful for? And I, I mean, I was being silly, but I was very passionate about how the company that makes crescent rolls had made a crescent roll without the seams um, so that you could use it like as flat pastry to wrap a, a thing of cheese in. <laughs> And I like told everybody about how grateful I was that that company, I think it's Pillsbury, made crescent rolls without the little things. And so having Jack gave me a place to put that passion. So I no longer will talk somebody's ears off about crescent rolls. Rather, I spend my time advocating for people with disabilities. It has obviously changed my career path. You know, I was in a general practice as an attorney and now almost all of my clients have a child with a disability, whether I'm doing special education work, which is about 80% of my work, divorce work or special needs estate planning. So, but in addition to that, I have found a real passion for advocating for people with disabilities in state and federal government. So I love going to Capitol Hill and talking about disability issues. I go to Frankfurt here in Kentucky um, and I serve on the Government Affairs Committee, <clears throat> excuse me, for the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Cincinnati. I do some advocacy work with kind of a subset of the National Down Syndrome Congress and I'm really proud of that work and I really, really, really like that work. Um, 
My special education journey really started as a result of um, a difficult time that we had getting Jack into kindergarten and into the, the least restrictive environment for him for kindergarten. Um, that's probably another podcast as we've been together fairly long today. But I'll tell you that I used the same principles that I learned in all of these experiences in order to muddle my way through that discussion that we had with our district that lasted several months and it did give me an autoimmune condition, it was so stressful. But really it's the experiences that I've had, the every single experience, the choice that I've made to stay optimistic, to stay collaborative, to do the next right thing those are the things that have led me to develop the principles that I use when I advocate for my clients that have special education plans. It's those kinds of things. I've taken the hardships that I've experienced and I've crafted them into kind of a relentless optimism and a can't fail attitude. And that's why I'm so successful at getting clients results, I think. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself because I think it's important that you know about me, but I also want to impress on you the idea that optimism is a choice. The idea that simply being pleasant, collaborating with people on any kind of a team, whether it's an IEP team or not, that is a choice that you get to make. And being the voice for somebody that maybe doesn't have a voice or can't express their voice as articulately as you can, that is quite an honor. And so if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you are somebody in the community that works with somebody with a disability, I hope that that helps. I hope that you can take a little bit of my experiences and craft them into something that's true for you and something that's collaborative. So thanks so much for listening today. I'd love to know your thoughts. This is um, somewhat uncomfortable to do, particularly without somebody else telling this, to tell the story to in person. So tell me what you think about today's episode. You can drop me an email or you can DM me on Instagram or Facebook. And um, I will see you at the conference this Saturday, January 23rd, 2021, 9 to uh, 9 to 5 Eastern, and you can register on my website, ashleybarlowco.com backslash conference.